A Christmas Carol by Charles Dickens Stave One, Part One Marley was dead, to begin with. There is no doubt whatsoever about that. The registrar of his burial was signed by the clergyman, the clerk, the undertaker and the chief mourner, Scrooge. And Scrooge's name was good upon anything. Old Marley was as dead as a doornail. This must be distinctly understood, or nothing wonderful will come of this story that I am about to relate. Oh, but he was a tight-fisted hand to the grindstone was Scrooge, a squeezing, retching, grasping, scraping, clutching, covetous-old sinner, hard and sharp as flint, from which no steel had ever struck but a generous fire, secret and self-contained and solitary as an oyster, the cold within him froze his old features, nipped his pointed nose, shriveled his cheek, stiffened his gait, made his eyes red, his thin lips blue, and spoke out shrewdly in his grated voice. Of all the good days in the year, on Christmas Eve, old Scrooge sat by his counting house. It was cold, bleak, biting weather foggy withal, and he could hear the people in the court outside go wheezing up and down, beating their hands upon their breasts and stamping their feet upon the pavement stones to warm them. The city clocks had only just gone three, but it was quite dark already. The fog came pouring in every chink and keyhole and was so dense without that although the court was the narrowest, the houses opposite were but mere phantoms. The door of Scrooge's counting-house was open that he could keep an eye upon his clerk, who, in a dismal little cell beyond, copied letters. Scrooge had a very small fire, but the clerk's fire was so very much smaller that it looked like one coal. The clerk put on his white comforter, and tried to warm himself at the candle, in which effort, not being a man of strong imagination, he failed. Merry Christmas, Uncle. God save you. Ah, humbug. Christmas a humbug, Uncle? You don't mean that, I'm sure. I do. Merry Christmas. What right have you to be merry? What reason have you to be merry? What reason have you to be morose? You're rich enough. Ah, humbug. Don't be cross, uncle. What else can I be when I live in such a world of fools as this? Merry Christmas. What's Christmas time to you but a time for paying bills without money? A time for finding yourself a year older but not an hour richer? If I could work my will, every idiot who goes about with Merry Christmas on his lips should be boiled in his own pudding and buried with a stake of holly through his heart. <laughs> he should. Uncle. Nephew. <laughs> keep Christmas in your own way. Let me keep it in mine. Keep it? But you don't keep it. Let me leave it alone, then. Much good it has ever done you. There are many things from which I might have derived good by which I have not profited, I dare say, Christmas among the rest. But I am sure I have always thought of Christmas time, when it has come around, as a good time, a kind, forgiving, charitable, pleasant time. And therefore, uncle, though it has never put a scrap of gold or silver in my pocket, I believe that it has done me good and will do me good, and I say, God bless it. (laughs) You're quite the powerful speaker, sir. I wonder you don't go into Parliament. Don't be angry, Uncle. Come, dine with us tomorrow. Humbug. Good afternoon. 
I want nothing from you. I ask nothing of you. Why can we not be friends? Good afternoon. I am sorry, with all my heart, to find you so resolute. So, a Merry Christmas, Uncle. Good afternoon. And a Happy New Year. Scrooge and Marley's, I believe. Have I the pleasure of addressing Mr. Scrooge or Mr. Marley? Mr. Marley has been dead these seven years. Oh, oh, I, I'm so sorry to hear that. Well, at this festive season of the year, Mr. Scrooge, it is more than usually desirable that we should make some slight provision for the poor and destitute, who suffer greatly at the present time. Many thousands are in want of common necessaries. Hundreds of thousands are in want of common comforts, sir. And the workhouses... Are they still in operation? They are. Still, I wish I could say they were not. The treadmill and the poor law are in full vigour, then? Uh, yes, uh, full vigour. And very busy, sir. Uh, a few of us have endeavoured to raise a fund to buy the poor some meat and drink and some means of warmth. We choose this time because it is a time of all others when want is keenly felt. What shall I put you down for, sir? I wish to be left alone. Since you ask me what I wish, gentlemen, this is my answer. I don't make merry myself at Christmas, and I can't afford to make idle people merry. I help to support the establishments I have mentioned. They cost enough, and those who are badly off must go there. Many can't go there. And many would rather die. If they would rather die, then let them die and decrease the surplus population. <laughs> Good afternoon, gentlemen. At length, the hour of shutting up the counting house arrived. With an ill will, Scrooge dismounted his stool and reluctantly nodded and grunted at the expectant clerk in the tank, who instantly snuffed out his candle and put on his hat. Both gentlemen set outside into the cold and foggy evening. The sounds of the city were all around them, yet... The oppression of the darkness made them both feel like they were the only two left in the world. You'll want all day tomorrow, I suppose. If quite convenient, sir. It's not convenient and it's not fair. If I was to stop half a crown for it, you'd think yourself ill-used, I'll be bound. <laughs> And yet, you don't think me ill-used when I pay a day's wages for no work? It's only once a year. I suppose you must have the whole day. Be here all the earlier next morning. Scrooge, like every evening, made his way home directly from his counting house. And, like every other evening, he was confronted with his own front door, and staring him right in the face, as per usual, was the door knocker. Now it is a fact that there was nothing at all peculiar about the knocker on the door of the gloomy chambers, except that it was very large. So let any man explain to me, if he can, without it undergoing any intermediate process of change, how it was that it was no longer a knocker, but Marley's face. It was not an impenetrable shadow as the other objects of the yard were, but had a dismal light to it. He looked at Scrooge as Marley used to look, with ghostly spectacles turned up on his ghostly forehead. As Scrooge looked fixedly at this phenomenon, it was a knocker again. Shaking his head to regain his wits, he then put his hand upon the key, turned it sturdily, walked in, and lighted his candle. Humbug!
Christmas Carol, adapted, directed, and produced by Paul A.T. Wilson. Narrator, Paul A.T. Wilson. Fred, Philip Barker. Scrooge, Oliver Fry. Gentleman 1, J. Brewer. Gentleman 2, Paul A.T. Wilson. Bob Cratchit, Richard Heaven. Music, David Pudney. Distributed under the Creative Commons Attribution 4.0 International License. Mm-hmm.